I'm really pleased to be able to introduce to you Rachel Clark, who's going to be talking to us about anti-racism and standing on the shoulders of giants, which is one of my favourite phrases. Over to you, Rachel. Fabulous. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to, um, to be here. It's almost the afternoon, 10 minutes to go. Um, I just wanted to, um, to share with you, and hopefully the screen um, will be able to, to come up. Fantastic. So um, as it's already been said, standing on the shoulders of giants, anti-racism, learning, leading and legacy. My name is Rachel Buck. Um, I'm one of the co-creators of Promote Equality. Um, and I also do my own uh, consultancy outside of schools and organisations all around anti-racism. Um, I think sometimes we can take for granted uh, the fact that there have been lots of people who come before us in the field of, uh, of anti-racism. And one of the people who've, who've done, whose legacy um, I'm living out and whose shoulders I'm standing quite firmly upon um, is my grandmother. Uh, and that's Betty Campbell, who you can see in the statue um, here in front of you. Her statue was unveiled in September. She was the first black head teacher in Wales. She was also um, somebody who was a pioneer in the field of anti-racism. And she did a lot of work um, with the young people and also her school community and her local community um, to really build, a, a, a build on equality and equity. She really instilled a sense of um, self-belief um, and the value that everybody should be seen and heard equally, that nobody's voice is above or beneath anyone else's, and that we need to build a curriculum that's really fit for purpose to tell everybody's stories. Now, that was really important for her to do. Um, and the, the concept behind her statue is one of a mother tree. And some of you might already know what that is. I, I wasn't as advanced as many of you, I'm sure. But uh, the concept of the mother tree um, is that what scientists have revealed to be a really important way um, trees take care of saplings, that older trees take care of saplings. And that was the concept used. So the shoulders um, are to represent the canopy um, that, that trees have and, and mother trees have to, to protect the saplings from not receiving too much light. And statues are along the bottom of children from many different walks of life, cultures, faiths, backgrounds. One of them is actually my daughter, which is great. And, and what's, what's really, really important that I I've taken for granted growing up with her as a grandmother um, is the, that sense of belonging, that sense of value, that sense of fitting in. Um, that's something that, that was really, really important for her that I have taken for granted. Now, as a, as a school leader myself, because I'm also a deputy head teacher of a large school, my legacy and living out of that legacy is trying to instill a real positive sense of belief in every child that comes through our schools. When I carry on, um, carry out the work I do with schools and other organisations, anti-racism is all about value. It's all about belonging. It's all about self-worth. Now, if you're somebody who's been brought up and born in this country um, from a white background, it might seem, um, anti-racism work might seem really difficult. You might think that it's a really good thing to do, but you're not really sure why it's important. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my story and how um, how I've taken and, and, and taken up this mantle of anti-racist work and, and the reasons why. So I've got a picture of plasters um, in varying skin tones on the right of the screen. And that's really important because in the 80s in, in London, in Brent, which is an incredibly diverse uh, bake up, when you used to fall over and cut your knee or cut your leg or, you know, have a scratch on your arm, you used to go to the welfare person who was often at that point a lady who would bring out a massive roll of plasters. But that roll was never in my skin tone. Now, that's only something really, really, really small, understandably so. But looking down at my skin, seeing that different shade, it made me feel uncomfortable. It made me feel a little bit strange. And what we have to realise is that anti-racism work and anti-racism practice is really important to not other, to not reinforce the othering of communities, of non-white background, of majority, global majority um, people. 
And the small things like that can make a difference because People think that racism is about big, bold statements or the insignia or the slurs that are used or the physical um, harm that can be caused, unfortunately. That is part of it, but it's not all of it. The othering and the daily othering that takes place does not support people from global majority or UK ethnic minority backgrounds to really feel a sense of belonging. And I've got another picture of a penguin there because I think it really helps to to understand and, and to share with you what it can feel like um, going into uh, spaces that are white majority spaces in the UK. Feeling like you stick out, seeing that you do stick out, putting up with the glances and the stares that linger for a little bit too long. All of that really does not help anybody to feel like they belong and myself somebody who is a fairly confident person who's been uh, born into a family um, of giants um, who has had it in drummed in from a really young age you are not better than anybody but please remember you are also no worse it still leaves me a little bit shaken at times and so for the young people that we educate it's really really important that we signal through everything we do that everybody is of equal value and everybody is of equal worth. And that, for me, is what anti-racism is all about. Everybody who goes through, um, through teacher training and or who is an educator of some description and works in education does so, does so because they want to challenge, they want to motivate, they want to engage, they want to love, they want to inspire young children to, to grow and to develop in the right ways. But anti-racism learning is really, really important to make sure that this happens well. And it can seem hard at times. Now, on the screen, you can see three different diagrams. One is somebody who is actively racist. The second one is somebody who's being non-racist. The third one is somebody who's being anti-racist. And what you can't see um, is you can't see the moving walkways in between. So the first one is uh, somebody moving in that direction of that moving walkway, somebody who's actively racist, somebody who's really trying um, to go above and beyond to offend to her along those lines. Most people do not fall into that ca category at all. Most people do fall into that middle bracket of being non-racist. So just standing still, not doing anything really racist at all. But because the structures in society are constructed in that way, unfortunately, they're still upholding those. To be anti-racist is to move against that travelling walkway, um, which takes a lot of hard work. And it takes a lot of hard courage. And it's something that I really, really would like everybody to, to do. It's really important that that takes place because we have um, societal norms and values at the moment that do not value everybody equally. And as a young person um, growing up, you can start off by feeling as if you're cute. And then as soon as you start to age, you start to become a little bit more threatening until you get a bit older. And that quote in the middle, when do I go from cute to dangerous, is really, really important, particularly when we're thinking about the intersectionality between gender and race as well. And that's something we have to do. So I wanted to, to finish finally with um, a quote that says, education systems and educational institutions have an important role and responsibility in addressing and eliminating racism. That's really, really important for us to hold on to. We've got to do the hard work, we've got to roll up our sleeves, and we've got to be committed and take on that courage to do so. I hope you found that real brief 10 minute slot really, really interesting. Um, my contact details there, should anybody um, be uh, interested in, in getting in touch, I know that there's going to be um, a Q&A session that I'm going to participate in. Um, but we as educators really do have a responsibility to lead um, and sort of carry out the legacy of anti-racist learning and practice. Thank you, everybody. I think I'm out of time. I'm looking forward so to the much. questions anyone might have. It was absolutely lovely um, to hear you talk. So thank you so much. And I loved hearing your daughter's voice in the background. Like, don't ever apologise for your daughter being in the room, because that's the reminder, isn't it? That, that, that is the legacy. That's the next generation. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs>
I, I, love, I love the metaphor. Um, thank you for explaining the statue and this idea of the mother tree and the saplings. Yeah. I think that's a beautiful sort of metaphor. Do you want to just share a little bit about the work you're doing on anti-racism yeah. in Wales? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so when it's further ahead um, in comparison to the rest of the UK, they have um, made black history mandatory from this September. They've revised their curriculum to really um, make sure that Kinevin, which is the sense of value and belonging, is threaded through. Um, they've got an anti-racist action plan. Um, so they've pledged to be an anti-racist country by 2030. So I'm doing lots and lots of work with Welsh schools and local authorities um, to support them on their journey, really. So what I've done is um, co-created a whole system um, worth of anti-racist training um, and development for schools and organisations. And it's been deliberately put together and carefully crafted so it can be self-led if needed. Um, I'm also part of the Welsh Government funded DARPOL team um, and that's made up of a conglomerate of, of different uh, participants and, and I'm one of them and so we've run different series of, of anti-racist learning for senior leaders, for class teachers, for TAs um, and also for wider groups that work within the school so yeah lots going on at the moment it's really exciting. Brilliant. Am I right in thinking that you're working with Liz Pemberton doing the early years work and Aisha Thomas doing the secondary work? So you've got tier specific strategies as well? Yeah, that's something else as well. So, yeah, uh, myself and Liz have worked um, separately on, on some early years Wales work. Myself, Liz and Aisha um, are working on some um, early years Wales stuff as well, looking at leadership. And it's more of a coaching um, project model that will take place between um, October and July of the next academic year. So that's really exciting. Um, and yeah, if anybody wanted to get in touch about that, um, then please do feel free. But there's lots and lots going on. I think it's it's more around if you're willing and prepared to go on this and the cost of not being willing and prepared to go on this journey. As you said, the future generation are the ones um, that we want to, to equip with the tools needed to make them feel of equal value. Mm. So why is it Wales are getting this right and England aren't getting this right? Like, what, what's the difference in the systemical societal kind of makeup that Wales are leaning into this work and pioneering it? I think it's because of the devolved government. Um, our UK government is conservative at the moment um, and it seems as if our government has very right leaning views. Um, I mean, Nadine Sahawi a few months back was talking about teaching the full, lo uh, the full story and, and let's remember the good parts of colonialism. And actually, if you're somebody who is um, is somebody who's uh, an ancestor or whose ancestor was living under colonial rule, then actually, from our perspective, there weren't good sides to, to colonialism. Um, so I think the difference is the devolved government versus the UK government and the political leanings has supported that. Um, but ultimately, this is about belonging. It's about equal value and it's about worth. And it's my genuine belief that we as educators have a duty of care to everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for that diagram, really making it explicit the difference between not racist and anti-racist, because I mean, is that a difference that Wales are more active in their commitment where there's a passivity or complicity, perhaps? Here? Yeah, there's, yeah, absolutely. There's a growing understanding that it is about rolling up your sleeves and taking action and working against the structural racism that does exist in society, as opposed to understanding racism as being very binary and linked and wrapped up in you're a good person therefore you cannot do anything that is racist um and i think that that's that's where our development really comes from and, and needs to to sort of move into um across the rest of the uk that understanding that not being actively racist does not stop the structural racism from existing you've got to actively work against it and that's where the school structures and policies and procedures really do come in and that real critiquing of the um the interpersonal racism and our thoughts feelings ideas and beliefs that we hold yeah absolutely yeah. so there's, there's like you say there's that willingness to to actually lean into this work well yeah. i think your grandmother would be very very proud of you and you are standing on great shoulders but you're also filling her shoes and and helping drive forward that next chapter so brilliant work rachel really great to have you here and thank you so much for sharing your narrative and the work you're doing Thank you. Thank you, Hannah.